Good morning and welcome to our webinar, Setting Up and Optimising Important Pages on Your Website. Today's webinar, we are focusing on some of the, the key pages that you shall have across your website. And in terms of optimising, it's not so much around SEO, uh, but it is around um, optimising and actually thinking about the user experience when they're on your website. So just... Oh, there we go. Uh, so today our webinar speakers are myself, so I will be taking some of the presentation today. Um, but also joining me uh, is Rhonda, who's an agency general manager at Zeld, but also the founder and uh, chair for Time Out Charitable Trust, um, and has a good insight into some of those key pages for her own Time Out website. Welcome, Rhonda. Hi, thanks for having me. It's awesome to have you here. Uh, so how the webinar will run today. Um, so just a quick few quick things. Um, if you've not been on a Zoom before, if you can't hear us, there is an audio setting, setting button down on the bottom right uh, left here. Um, and so you just click into that and you should be able to play around with the settings in order to hear us. Um, how do you ask a question? So at any time, if you have questions, please feel free to bring them up. Um, if it's the right timing, we will actually, um, you know, bring it into the webinar. Otherwise, we do have a whole question section at the end as well. So quite easy just to click the Q&A question, um, or you can also use the chat. The raise hand feature means that um, you're actually wanting to speak uh, through your microphone. Um, I don't think we've probably ever had anyone do that, but if you feel the need, that's another way you can ask us a question. Um, and if you miss anything today, uh, do not worry, we will be sending you a copy of the slide as well as the video recording from today um, so that you're able to go through and catch up on any areas you may have missed um, or just get some of those key notes from today's webinar. Uh, so just handing over to you, Rhonda, uh, for setting up and optimizing important pages on your website. Thanks, Lisa. Okay. Appreciate it. So I'll just share my screen. Can we swap over there? Yes. Oh, it's bringing up this weird thing. Let me just figure this out. There we go. Should be able to see at the page there with what we're going to be talking about today. So today we're going to be talking about some of the pages on our website that can affect your success. Um, and I think they affect your success so much that they're worth, why, this is why we're doing the webinar today. We thought it's worth definitely concentrating on them. Um, and we're going to go through these seven different types of pages individually so that you can kind of get an understanding of some really good examples mm -hmm. of these types of pages. Um, so we'll detail some of the elements that you need to have on those pages um, and basically just go through them and try and make it as practical as possible. If you've got questions, please just pop them through. We want to make this as helpful as possible. So um, the pages we are talking about today are important for both lead generation types of sites and also e-commerce. Mm. Um, as consumers, we go through a very similar process when we're deciding to buy a product or to enlist a service. Basically, we are all motivated by trust. And there are a lot of different aspects of trust that um, get taken into account when we go online. And each of these pages tries to resolve at least one aspect of trust and help the website visitor to take action or the desired action that you want them to take, such as making an inquiry or, or buying. So 57% of New Zealanders say they have stopped buying a brand altogether over an incident that reduced trust. And 44% um, have told friends or family not to use a product because they don't trust it. So the level of trust needed for someone to take action can be higher if the product is of high value mm -hmm. or if it involves a third party. So, for example, um, if I'm buying a gift for someone else, I need to trust that product even more, that its quality will be good, that it will do what it says it does because I'm giving it to someone else. Um, or, you know, if I've spent several months saving my pennies to make a luxury purchase, 
again, I will want to have, I have a higher level of trust that needs to be satisfied because I don't want to waste my money. Um, so it pays to think um, like the people landing on your site, um, profile them, find out, kind of, kind of decide what their age is, what are their spending habits, why are they buying, and when they come, what problem are you trying to resolve for them by them coming to your site? Um, and sometimes you can end up with several different profiles, and we did this for time out. So we have people that come to the site who are terminally ill and, or um, are helping a family through terminal illness. And we also have people who are health professionals coming. And then we also have the home donors, people donating time in holiday homes. So we have several different profiles. And from those profiles, you start to understand what is that person wanting to do when they're coming to the site? And what sort of things do we have to do to build up that trust for that particular person or that group? Then given all this information, <laughs> um, yeah, you, you basically have to then look at the site. What, what can it, what on, what on my About Us page will those people be needing to hear? Slip to this next slide. So, no matter what your product, service, or organization, you have some key pages where you'll either build trust and credibility, or if you don't work on them, you will lose trust and credibility. And I think this is an important point to make. If you don't do them well, it's not like you're just going to stay, at, um, you know, mediocre and it will be okay. You'll actually lose trust and credibility which is not often the case with some things. Some things you can gain if you do them really well, otherwise you'll just kind of hold fire. With these sorts of pages, if you don't do them well, you can actually lose trust and credibility. So again, it means they're worth taking the time to look into. And I've been asked which of these pages is the most important. Um, and to me, the home pages, because it is the page where often people are coming to first. They've got a link to it, more highly, more likely to have a link to the homepage. Um, if they're searching, most of the time they'll come through to the homepage. So the homepage is probably the most important place to where we've got to make sure that we're building trust and credibility. However, right behind it, and I mean right behind it, are pretty much all of the rest. So the average joke public consumer is a modern consumer. Um, but they spend a lot of time, and I say they, but let's let's be right. I spend a lot of time, we spend a lot of time online. And if your site does not um, satisfy me and help build trust and credibility, I go to the next. I have expectations now because I am a modern online user. So Lisa, I thought I'd hand the time over to you to talk a bit about the homepage. Yes, thanks for that. Uh, it's coming back to me. Um, so as Rhonda very, yeah, I mean, correctly pointed out, the homepage is the main page. It is the one that everyone will come to or land on. And even if they actually click through to somewhere else originally, they're most likely to visit your homepage um, at some point. And so your homepage is that the first three seconds really to make an impression on someone. And that's why it's important to get really that first image and, and that message correct. Um, so what we call the, the message is what's called a unique value proposition. Um, and that should be front and center. And more often center, don't try and put it to one side or the other, try and have it right there in, in your consumer's face really, because those three seconds where they start reading that, they're starting to make the decision, am I on the right side? And so if they cannot tell that by reading this space, they are more likely to go away and find someone else that answers that for them. Or they may read a little bit more on, but they still could feel confused because there wasn't a clear outline. Um, so it should be front and center, your UVP, and it should ensure there's clear messaging about who you are, what you do, and what you're offering. So as a consumer, it needs to answer why, um, why am I on your site? Is it for what I'm looking for? 
Um, and then, as we always say, um, picture speaks a thousand words. You want to use your hero image to back these up. So the hero image should be very relative to what you're saying in your UVP. Um, and it should, well, it should stand out, but it, you should make sure that your UVP font or, and size and color um, really stand out then on top of your image. So for example, if you were having um, your, your color of your font in white, you probably would want to choose an image that potentially has a black overlay over it just to fade it a little and have those white, um, the white font really stand out but you wouldn't say maybe pick a picture of the ocean or something that maybe it has or the sky I should say um, because it may have too much of a light color to it and not help stand out the, um, the font color as much or you may need to change the font color. Um, so the other key thing I think as well with just going back to the UVP don't try and saturate it with keywords for what you feel people are searching for it really is that quick elevator pitch, am I on the right page? Am I, are they going to deliver what I want if I keep searching here? Um, and what you can do, and, and timeout's a really good example, and I'm about to flick across some others, um, is you can have quite a short, maybe three to seven word sentence, um, and then back that up with some further text underneath just to explain it a bit more. And the timeout website's one that does that well, because um, they're just saying what the main, um, their main UVP is, and then they back that up with further information um, with a longer sentence that's in smaller in a smaller font. Um, and that way you're keeping it short, um, but you're also getting the information across. Um, no one wants to read a paragraph at this point. Um, then the other key thing that is you need to have in this area is call to actions um, that basically direct your customers onto the next step. So some will scroll down and want to keep reading, but others will go, where to from here? So once they've read your UVP and gone, yes, I'm in the right spot, they'll then go, well, where to from here? So for, a, um, for an online shop, it might be shop now. Um, for a, um, you know, a hairdresser, it might be book an appointment now. So there's just those key things that you need to have there. Um, you may... Or, or find out more as well, um, because depending on the type of service or what you're offering, um, there might be a bit more of a journey um, in, in there. So I'm just going to stop my screen share for a second, because um, I just brought up some other websites as well. Um, so as you can see here, um, this is just another website. So it's for um, basically flaxseed uh, supplements for, for animals. Um, and it's quite clear to see they've actually got a video in the background, um, which I think tends to lean on those heartstrings of those people who do have pets and, and look after animals, um, certainly does for me, because um, very much love animals. And so that's sort of going, okay, it's, a, it's something to do with animals. And then I can quickly read flaxseed based nutritional supplements. And that to me goes great, that's what they're selling. Um, and then if I want to find out a bit more. They've also noted here that they're actually made um, in New Zealand um, and that, you know, they're really good for your pets is what they're trying to get across there. So, and then we come down, very clear call to action, view products. Okay, so very quite clear um, area. And then I'll just come across to more a service-based one. Um, so we have this service base. So right now, image telling me, okay, something to either do with houses or fence um, or something around the house. Um, then I can quickly read uh, quality maintenance free PVC fencing to enhance your home. Okay, I'm on a website for fencing. That's what I'm looking for. Perfect. Um, and then they sort of give me a bit more detail. So letting me know they have lots of designs, um, that it's durable, long lasting. So it's now starting to give me some idea of what it is. Um, and that very clear call to action, request a free quote. Um, so I guess also with your call to action, it can be quite daring. So, you know, like I'm, you're going to need to tailor for the people who are ready to just go, I just need someone to come and talk to me. I don't have time to look on the website, I need someone to talk to me. But you've also got to cater for those that want to find out more information as well. And that's where you can have the rest of the information below to scroll through. So now just coming back to talk a bit more, um, about that. So now that you've sort of 
sold your business in that first main area, you then want to come down your homepage a little. And what generally should be outlined next um, or quite soon after that main image and UVP is what we call features and benefits. Um, so these are used to provide valuable information to your visitor quickly. So why your business product or service? Um, some key and unique points to cover, in particular with what's going on with the, at, in the world at the moment and with where the trends are. Um, very important if you're NZ made, NZ owned and operated, very key to point that out. Um, people are buying local still and it's still a huge thing in New Zealand, the team of 5 million. So we are going to want to have that pointed out really well if that's the case. Uh, things like sustainability, so if it, is it eco-friendly, do you have a certain process you go through to make your business sustainable, um, that is another trend that is becoming quite strong and getting more consumers on board with businesses. Um, and then also if it's natural, organic, vegan, etc. So again, sort of leaning on this whole sustainability. If you're looking after the earth in, term of, in terms of climate, that's starting to come through a lot more um, and what people are looking for. You can use the features and benefits area to go what is special about your offering um, and use it to, and, sorry, make sure it is short, sharp headlines. So you don't, again, want massive paragraphs. You want very short, sharp headlines. And then use icons that catch the eye, but also relate to what you're talking about there. So coming back to the examples here, uh, for the fencing one that I pointed out, they've actually kept it very simple, but it makes a, a it makes the point very well. So that it's maintenance free, long lasting, durable, cost effective, there's a guarantee, range of styles and non-toxic. So the logo, uh, sorry, the icons here are using the branding um, colors and then just very quick, simple words to get those the message across. For something though, like, oh, sorry, uh, for the supplements for the animals that we were looking at, um, they've had to dive in a bit more and actually they're using their features and benefits to help distinguish between their different products. Um, so you know there's code and condition, vitality and well-being, digestion, joint and mobility, and they've color coded those that match how the um, branding on their products are. And then they've just put a bit more extra detail underneath it. Um, so this one has a bit more information, but it suits what they, what they're trying to sell is giving people enough information to work out which one to click through to. So again, coming back to that call to action and really driving your consumers on your website to where you need them to go. Um, and, and so it's giving enough information there to do so. Um, so very important area that should always come straight underneath the um, main UVP and hero image ideally. And now back to Rhonda, who's going to take us through About Us. Awesome. Thanks, Lisa. Now, the About Us page is actually one of my most favourite pages on any website, whether it's my own website or other people's. It's the one I go to a lot. And again, it's because I'm trying to build trust between myself and, the, and, and my supplier that I'm looking for, right? Um, so the About Us page is one of the key supporting pages on your website that tells the story of your brand, including your origins and biggest milestones. It creates a positive first impression and builds a connection between your potential customer and your business. Really the biggest goal of the About Us page is to inspire um, your, the customer or the page visitor to take action and to feel an emotional connection which is not some new age sort of hippie stuff. It's actually genuinely what is happening, even on the smallest level, when someone is coming to your site and deciding whether to interact with your business or not. So questions to ask when you're deciding what to do on your About Us page is what emotions do you want your customers to feel? And what is the specific action you want them to take after reading about your story? And you can do this in more than one way. So you can, you can use everything such as colors, images, text, text, and also video. So you've got quite a few tools there. And it's amazing the story you can tell from just even an image. 
And I think that's what we did with Time Out quite a lot, actually, is looked at our images and that we wanted them to be real. <laughs> we wanted them to be real family photos. We wanted them to actually show that these are, this is actually our people connected and trying, and this is what who we are. So we paid a lot of attention to that and spent a lot of time on getting the right images to try and tell that story. Um, no, oh, sorry, I just lost my mouse there for a second. There we go. So no, ma no matter the tone um, that you have for your brand, it's really important to be genuine. And so honesty and transparency will win, always win over on your website, no matter what your business is. So don't make anything out. If you have designed something and believe in it passion passionately, say so. If you've sourced a product, then say so and tell them where you've sourced it even and, and the credibility around that process that you went through. If you've been established for a number of years or a startup just because of COVID, tell people. This, these are all part of your story and this is where you can get you tell your story. So photos and videos, not just break up the text, but also add to the storytelling and the emotional connection like I've already said. Um, so talk about the products and services you sell. Describe for whom your products or services. Um, sorry, I actually meant to swap that over. So talk to you about the products and services you sell. Describe for whom the products or services are for. Share your core values of your business. Um, why you sell your products. Why you're different. And you know that stuff already because you're in that competitive market you know what makes you different from your competitors and tell about your business model and not what makes it unique and always include some kind of call to action on there whether you're going to take them through to the products or even questions most most often ask questions just include at least one call to action on there so I've just got a few examples of sites and um, my daughter's had a baby recently, so I've been looking for baby products. And this one really caught my eye, um, Bella Tuna. And, and her story is what makes her business quite different. And I love that she's just using white space here. And I love that she's breaking the story down into nice little, little chunks as well. She introduces to me to the team. She also tells me about her products. And so it's, it's a lot of information very quickly, but done in a really digestible manner. Um, and then she's got a video here. That, and when, when I watched the video, I really did connect with this product to the extent that I inquired how I could get it in New Zealand because you can't actually get them in New Zealand at the moment. But they're just, I mean, and they're nothing special. They're just baby products that you could get different ones from down the road. But her About Us page really wanted me to buy from her. Another good example I thought was actually Te Papa. So Te Papa, again, had quite a few areas. They've got a lot of information, but they structured it really well because if you want to know about the leadership, the curation teams, the organisation structure, the history, they've got it all there, but the images are actually really reflective of the area and it's just set out structurally really nice. So you don't often have to be completely kind of creative. You still have to match your, your brand. And I thought this actually matched the brand really, really well. Um, and another one that I really liked was Mainland Cheeses. And I liked even just the name of the About Us page. They called it Our Craft. And I thought that was quite cool that they actually changed the name of it to match their brand and what they're trying to convey to everybody. Um, it actually shows some, some really nice stuff on there and it gives some videos, it's got the story there, it's very interactive and of course their core thing is cheese, so there's lots of amazing pictures on there of cheese and then even just about the organic milks etc, so some really lovely stuff on there. Yeah, so um, the the uh, About Us pages are really critical and I think they're worth spending some decent time on. I'm just going to go to the next one and this is the, the team page. So again, a, a page that we often forget about, 
um, we assume people know our teams <laughs> we, just because we know them ourselves. But introducing your team helps to humanise your brand. It communicates your company culture and, and helps get customers to know and trust your brand. So introduce each member of your team and, what, and the work that they do. Highlight significant milestones such as awards or recognitions. And you could include credentials as well as um, links to maybe your team's social profiles as well. Especially if you're a, a professional business, um, you want to show that their credibility is beyond even them working for you. Um, and I think if I just take you back again to some examples. Oh my gosh, did you hear that? That was stop people working in my house, sorry. But um, this is the timeout page. And one of the things that we really wanted to do with the team was to have their own, own pictures. And we didn't say that they had to do them in any particular way. It was any way that they wanted. And I think that was important that actually this is the way they want to be shown, which was really cool. And I do love Lisa's down the bottom there. <laughs> Because yeah. Lisa volunteers for time out. And I but love I the thought, snow. It gave yeah. me that chance just to go, here's a sneak peek at who I am. Yeah, yeah. And and I think the other thing that was important for time out, and, and this is um, a nice little pop-out function here, was that people understand why they're volunteering and why they're working for time out. And and that was that part of that connection, trying to get that connection so people can understand that we come from various different backgrounds, we have various professional abilities, but this is why I'm part of Time Out. And this is a core function that's part of the Zest um, Zealed sites as well, and part of the GEM sites, that you can actually have these team profiles looking really lovely with this pop-out. And you could include um, phone numbers here, you could include you know, people's professional qualifications, awards and recognitions, et cetera. But for time out, that wasn't really needed because that didn't fit what we were trying to achieve there. But if you look at, um, this is a site that we've been working on for Morisco and their team pages, their, their winery, and it wouldn't suit, right, that they're sitting in an office. Mm -hmm. I love that their team pictures are actually out on, uh, either in the field, in the winemaking area, you know, even on the farm, it just suits their brand so well. And then if you come through to their individual page, each person's got a video and that they explain why they work for Morisco and their connection to it. And I thought that was a really beautiful way of doing an About Us page. And then if you come to Chapman Trip, you know, which is a, one of New Zealand's leading law firms, you get a different emphasis. You get that people need to be able to contact. So you've got all these contact um, parts to the actual cards that, that each individual is on. You've got their LinkedIn, which would be really important as a professional to show that professional credibility. And then when you come through to the individual's page, when you scroll down, they're giving quite a, a big history about what they've been involved in and then actually papers that this person has actually been involved in publishing and had some part of. And you can see that for a legal firm, these aspects build huge trust and credibility. So if you are in that professional arena, it's good to put all this effort in because I've already scouted out this person if I'm thinking to go into Chapman Trip. Even if I don't want this particular person, I, I, it builds the whole company's trust and credibility. Etsy recently won an award for their team picture, which I thought was quite interesting. And you've got to remember, Etsy is one of the world's biggest home craft um, sites. So how would they make something look professional and yet still show that they're one of the world's biggest home craft um, sites? And again, it was showing this relaxed nature here. Um, they come down to their leadership team and, and it's nothing particularly special. Um, and again, you go you go through to a separate page, and again, it's not it's it's actually I don't actually think it's as good as Morisco's um, about us. Um, but this is the interesting thing when you scroll down. This is oh, actually wow. the rest of their team, and you can't none of these click through. But they're just trying to show that actually we're a team of this many people around the world, and I thought that's a really clever way to do it with 
you, you, telling your story through images. And, and I, I suspect that's why they've won the award. And it's not actually for this particular area, even though this does the right thing. It just shows this is their main leadership team and, and who they are. Yeah. So back to you, Lisa. It is very important. I was picking a physio the other day and I actually went to the About Us page um, and I felt comfortable with the people that were there, which made me decide to go with that particular physio. So I think it's right. very important. People are starting to go, I can look at information first and gather my decisions. Whereas I think people are starting to not just want to show up somewhere um, yeah. because they do actually want to have a bit of knowledge first. It goes back to that thing, that, you know, the internet's been around for so many years now that we are all becoming savvy online users. And I think COVID has escalated that people that have never been online have been online and they've been on it for now a year. Yes. <laughs> you know, so people are starting to get savvy with it. Definitely, definitely. So what I'm going to cover off now is another important page. It's one that if you are going to do that you need to make sure you keep doing. So like Rhonda touched on at the start, um, you know, by not doing it, you can actually lose trust and credibility, um, especially if it's something you started. So talking about blogs, um, creating high quality blog posts help you build credibility as a trusted source of information or advice on topics related within your industry. Um, so I am gonna cover off a, diff a few different ways you can actually utilize this. Um, but really what you want to do with your blog is pick a niche and focus on topics within that niche. And of course, related to your industry or, or what you're providing. Um, never saturate your blogs with keywords. So when people are reading these, they don't want to just read a whole lot of keywords. Um, and the reason why some people may try and put it, make it quite keyword heavy is they're trying to benefit more from the search engine optimization that can come with keywords. But there are other ways that you can inject keywords into your blogs without sort of making it a bit hard to read. Um, make sure you are writing with intent, purpose and value. So this is where you're really understanding what your customer may be wanting or needing from you um, and therefore then really zoning in on that um, and, and sort of really giving them advice without, you know, sometimes you want to give advice without giving away your trade secrets. I mean, everyone understands that. Um, but you want to be able to give them enough to potentially look at it themselves um, and then use that as part of their decision to come and, and purchase off you or choose a service with you. Uh, spending time creating good blog titles is really key. Um, part of that is because you need to try and capture that person's attention within those sort of two to three seconds again. So similar to the UVP on your homepage, Unique Value Proposition, um, you are wanting a blog title that will capture someone's attention quite quickly. Um, I notice on things like Facebook, when people are doing sponsored ads for their blogs, um, I will only click on ones that actually capture my interest still make me go oh what's that about um so it's a bit similar to also like news headlines as well you'll notice you'll probably have a bit of a trend on what news headlines you're more likely to click into than what you're not um make your content scannable so what we mean by this is it should be able to be quickly scanned over um, for people to take out key points um so for those that are time poor um they need to just be able to click into it gather some key points and then move on quickly. For others, they want to read the whole thing. So you do need to be thinking about both sides of the market there. Uh, choose images wisely and position them wisely within it. Um, so, you know, images will back up what you're saying. And uh, actually the next bit, the infographs and uh, videos are, are very key. So. Quite often within a blog post, you might have a couple of key points. At the end, turn that into a quick infograph so that people can go, here's my key, here's the key points. Um, they're very helpful. The other thing though, to, to make sure you don't fall into a trap of, and I think it's whether you're doing, working out whether you're going to write something or whether you're going to do a video, is trying to explain something that's actually really, really hard to write. 
um, and sometimes it's best just to do a video for it with a little bit of text around explaining what the video is for. People these days are very used to videos. They're constantly coming up on social media, on the news, etc. that you may look online. So it's becoming very common. Um, and quite a lot of people actually have more time for videos than they do have for reading. Um, they can play it in the background or they can be focusing on something else while it's playing. Um, and quality over quantity. So don't aim to always write a thousand word blogs. Um, you want to put the quality into the blog and not just have lots of words. Um, so I think that's a very key detail and probably also leads back to not saturating your blogs with keywords. Um, some will try and get more keywords in or more areas in, so they end up um, going for quantity rather than quality. Another key point there as well is you might find as you're writing that actually what you're writing about stems out and has further points that you want to talk about or further areas you want to engage in further. So why not then create it as sort of a part one, part two, part three sort of story or something that leads um, on to, from one another. Um, so that's another way that you can do it if you do start having lots of ideas, but you don't want to have the blog be too long. So as an example here, um, for Rhonda's one, because I just thought I'd cover off different examples for blogs. Um, Rhonda's, uh, sorry, timeouts, I should say, uh, their blog is used for our stories. So the stories basically are um, stories of both donors and recipients to the um, service that the timeout charity provides. Um, and it basically is explaining their story. Um, because it's happening quite often, there are, um, there are dates involved with it. So you can see when these people had their experience or donated their home, um, but they're using a blog in that way to basically engage with people who are new to the website, new to understanding what the charity is about, to then connect them with another, with a person's experience and get them to really understand um, and, and basically buy into it. Um, and that's a way you can utilize this. Um, so that's one way and I'm pretty sure I think if I move on to the next one, that is how I go. So another way to use the blogs is to do tips and tricks. So this way, you're not so much um, having to make sure maybe you do a blog once a month. You can do it less frequently. Um, but what you're doing here is you're using the blog features to basically do tips and tricks through your website um, and, and relation to your industry or your service or your product that you're providing. So Tips and tricks or how-to pages allow you to establish yourself as a figure of authority in your industry. Um, so basically making sure you know your customers know you know what you're talking about. So you build your brand's credibility and acquire your customers' trust by being a go-to for ways people can learn to use products, your products and do minor things themselves. Um, so again, you want to have things like infographs um, or sh and they should be quite short articles or if it's sort of a how-to guide, make sure it's step-by-step -step and very clear steps. Um, it could be a video tutorial. So it could be, you know, like uh, for example, that fencing website, it could be how to clean it. Could be a quick video on here's the best way to clean it to ensure that it's durable um, and lasts a long time. Um, and yeah, so I already touched on it, but the written guides, so those step-by-step -step areas. Um, websites that are doing this really, really well, uh, MITRE 10 and Bunnings, so they actually have full dedicated areas to this to teach people how to do things like come to our store, buy our timber, buy our nails, buy our hammers, etc. And here's how you create a plant box. And so that's how they're pairing it up. So they're going, here's all the things in the store you need from us, but here's how you actually put something together with that. Um, and by generating and inspiring ideas with their customers and people who are coming on their site through things like tips and tricks and how to, they're getting people to go, ah, oh, yeah, I could do with a planter box in my garden. Now let's go buy what I need for that. Um, so it is a good way because it's, I mean, for them in particular, for Mida Ten and, and Bunnings, it's pulling on the DIY heartstrings of New Zealanders and, and what the Kiwi go-to is, um, but it's also letting people know that it's actually quite easy to do these things. Um, like I said, you know, if you're a hairdresser, I keep going to hairdressing today, um, it might be, oh great, you know, you've come in, you've had your um, 
hair done, et cetera, and you've purchased something from us, here's how to use a hair straightener at home. You know, like just little things that people actually don't know how to do. And yes, they could go onto YouTube to do it, but you should have something there because you want your clients and, and your potential clients to feel that you actually are there to help them um, and, and give them information. So another way um, which you can use bl a blog feature um, because we do actually use similar features for these um, is by doing reviews and testimonials. So another one could also be case studies or highlighting projects that you've worked on. Um, so according uh, to the Spiegel Research Center, almost 95% of consumers read online reviews before making a purchase. I 100% agree with that because I do that quite often. Um, so again, it's pulling on that whole people relate to other people's experiences. So people buy from people. And I think regardless of how much we move more into technology, whatever AI comes up, et cetera, we are still, human behavior is to purchase from people. Um, so what they want to see are honest reviews and testimonials, and that will help deepen trust and increase the potential customer's chances of making a purchase. Um, the testimonials and reviews provide visitors and potential customers with confidence in your product or service. Um, images with text or video testimonials are much stronger than written reviews and testimonials. And again, it's because there's a deeper human connection when you're actually watching someone speak and you can pick up on body language. So that's where it's quite key. Um, and then focus on written first though, if you are starting out, because to get people to a video, it's often quite a lot harder. And like for the ones that we've done at Zealed, we've actually gone and talked with the client um, and asked them questions and then video edited it to put on this. Um, and that's what you would move, a stage you'd move into. So it is quite important um, because it is, it really, this is creating that human, um, human contact and, and pulling on those human behaviors where we will purchase from another person or someone else who's had a good experience. Um, and that's what they're wanting to see. In saying that, um, I know people probably quite often see Google reviews and you, you know, Google reviews, you can't really stop if it's good or bad. Um, but that's where, you know, by responding to them and showing people how you've responded to a situation that maybe has not worked out well, can actually say a lot about your business and build even more trust and credibility. So for me, I'm someone who says embrace any bad reviews as well and show people how well you deal with those and actually how you go to get a good solution in place for them. Not saying that everything has a solution sometimes, because sometimes it's not that that simple, um, but you know how you respond is really going to be key there. Um, but on your website, you can of course control that. Um, so on your website, you can just be posting really good comments, etc. Um, and so it's just a good feature to have there. And again, a blog layout or a blog sort of uh, functionality is a really good way to do that as well. Particularly if you offer different types of services, you could then start linking them together. So if you, you know, for us, if we we offer digital marketing, so we could have a whole bunch of reviews and testimonials under digital marketing and have people easily be able to go see that, and then a whole bunch under website development as well. Cool. Back across to you, Rhonda. Thanks, Lisa. And I think we have a previous webinar that deals with how to deal with negative reviews as well. So have a look on our webinar library if you want some extra tips for that. Um, contact us page. Now, my biggest thing here is have one. Um, don't make it hard to find, even if you don't want phone calls or want to channel emails uh, a certain way to make it easy. Um, yeah, you got to actually just make it easy to find on your menu and in the footer. And a visit to your contact us page shows explicit intent that someone wants to engage with you and get in touch with you. So don't make that hard. <laughs> I don't know how many times I've been to sites and I cannot find the contact us and have given up completely. And I still won't have bought the, the product because I had a question, I had a problem that I need, still needed resolving before I was going to purchase or make an appointment, etc. So by not making that easy, you actually do lose that on business. So the, you need to add certain information to a contact us, such as location, um, an image or of a map, phone number, email address, store hours, if you've got a physical store, 
and um, and put definitely a, an inquiry form on there. And I just want to show you a couple of examples here. Um, and one was uh, this one here. So St John's won an award for the most trusted uh, charity in New Zealand. And if you go to their contact us form, they not only make you know make it easy for you to find because it's actually on this top area here. They they actually channel the different types of contact that you might want to make. If you're wanting to give feedback or a compliment, that's how you do it. If you're making a complaint, that's how you do it. If you just want to do a general contact us, if you're needing first aid training, if you want to inquire about volunteering, there it is, and then the medical alarm inquiries. So to me, this is a beautiful contact us page because it helps define and channel your inquiry or in the information that you see when you click on the learn more, um, more around that area, and then it has a specific form for you or contact details based on where, how you might want to inquire there. So really, really nice. It also talks about the locations at the bottom here. Um, the other one that has done really well in the most trusted um, brands in New Zealand is Cookie Time. Uh, and Cookie Time's come a long way from back in the day when they'd started just making cookies and selling them directly. They now have lots of locations. And I thought this was really good. On their contact us form, they're giving actually specific phone numbers and emails for those different locations, as well as a general contact us form. They also have, um, if you're wanting it to go to a certain area, you can direct it to that area or certain type of inquiry. But again, if you don't, you can still submit the form. So just a couple of really nice um, ways of doing a contact form there. The other is to have a, a store locator. So if you've got lots of stores or locations around, put a, a, a map on there. Um, maps are really good because especially if, if people are coming to your site via mobile devices, they can click on the, that mobile um, map and then get um, directions from their phone on how to get to your location. And so don't make that frustrating for them. Actually put the map there with a pin and so that if they click on it, they can get directions. Also, if you've got several locations, it always helps to have a store locator with filters so that they can find their nearest store to you. And take basically what you're trying to do is build trust and credibility that you actually are around and, and a, are a store, but also um, take the frustration away from actually people being able to find you. And an interesting thing lately is that there's been a lot of overseas companies trying to sell and position themselves as New Zealand businesses. And so I go to the locations often to find out if there is even, even if it's not a, a physical store, where's the head office in New Zealand? Do they have an office in New Zealand at all? Even if I'm just going to buy online, I like to try and make sure that I am buying New Zealand and, and buying local is extremely important. It has become more important for consumers since COVID. So it's nice that even if you've only got a head office in the middle of you know, your home, that you put that there so that people can see that you are New Zealand based and that even if you are importing goods, you're a New Zealand distributor for those. And it just helps reassure people a lot that they will still buy from you. So I've got a nice example of, of one of these filters, and that's um, a COLA site that we've done. And they can you can filter here, and you can see here you can put your um, even your town or your suburb, and you can also decide whether you're going to show installers and or just the physical stores, and then you can scroll in and you can get to the the image and it gives you um, information around that store, their opening hours, even gives you a button to call or to get directions. So a really advanced um, map tool can really help clients. And again, like I said, just takes that frustration away. Um, our next area to look at is the logos. And you can have logos on your site for a few different reasons. Um, Logos are basically an opportunity to share your partners, suppliers, brands, or supporters. And so have a think about what kind of logos are useful for you to have display on your site. Um, they highlight who you work with and act as another element for social proof that helps you build credibility. 
Some customers might be searching for a specific brand, so seeing it there can help them know that they're in the right place to purchase. Um, you don't have to create a standalone page to showcase your partners. Um, you can incorporate it into either the home page, the About Us page, or to have a, a, a product page as well. And again, just to show you a, a little bit of a, um, an example of this is timeout. So our homepage, um, this is our homepage here, where we're coming down and an element on the homepage is some of our supporters. And we hope that this shows that Zealed is a, I mean, not Zealed, Time Out is a decent sized charity and that we are working with some really critical suppliers and, and coordinating with people in order to show that we are operating well and that we're not just a startup sort of charity that we've been around. And again, when you click on it, we have gone through to a page where we display more and give more of a brief about those, um, those supporters. And we do it for supporters. Um, you might do it because these are the brands you stock and you might put on, on the page a little bit more information around those brands as well. Um, so a portfolio. Um, so this is often one that people who are service-based businesses need to include. Um, it's one where you can uh, show work that you've done and some expertise into things. Uh, you can showcase your best works right with your target market uh, reader in mind. So often someone coming and thinking of getting some work done themselves. So they need to kind of be thinking ab about that when, they, when they're coming. So you might tag some of this work specifically. You know, if I've got a zeal, for example, um, display some of our portfolio and we will tag them that this is an e-commerce site or this is built on WordPress or this is built on Shopify and um, those sorts of things because we do all different types of brands so we we're just trying to make it easy when someone comes across that they can see not just your work but actually have some details to it that the person coming is, is expecting or, or um, have to help answer those questions as to why they're coming. So you want to make it easy to navigate as well. And you want to pro provide context for the project. So kind of like the date, um, maybe where it was. And, and the context can be specific depending on your business as to what context information is more needed. And then you want to um, balance the detail with being concise. So you don't want to over, over stress people with the amount of information there. And I've got an example of a really nice one here. Um, and this is Create Renovations, a site that we've worked on. And so they're doing renovations all the time. They're key to their, their portfolio is images. So they get professional images done for any project that they're gonna be putting on this website. Um, and they do before and afters. They tell you a little bit about where the house is the areas that they um, actually did, and then they give a little description and then some key bullet points, I think was a really nice way of doing it. So they're not overloading with information. You can just see that this is super inviting. If I'm wanting to get some renovations done that I would look through these images and just have a look. And I think after looking through this, it would make me want to do an inquiry if I was into, um, into um, getting a renovation done. So just going on to the frequently asked questions, and this is actually another one of my favorite places on a website. Um, and it really is because it, it, it can help you um, answer a lot of the questions yourself. So you're not having to feel like you're dumb and asking. Often you can feel embarrassed that actually, why do I need to ask this question? And so instead of asking it, you often don't do it. And then you go along to another competitor's site who does actually answer the question for you. So also really good FAQs can stop a lot of emails um, because they aren't getting their questions answered right away. And so common, common questions to cover in your FAQs is things like shipping lead times, dispatch or order fulfillment details, returns policy, refunds policy, 
and basically put yourself in your website user shoes and that goes back to even when we started this webinar where you've created these profiles of who's going to be using your website and put yourself into those users shoes and, and think what questions would that user want answered and actually create an FAQ about them. They don't need to be long, but they can be short and sharp, um, the, the answers. Um, and I've got a couple of examples. Um, and one is zeal, uh, timeouts, sorry. So timeouts, FAQs. Um, we had, again, like I said at the beginning, we had two different major groups, a recipient and a donor. And so we did two sets of FAQs there. So a recipient, recipient FAQ and the house donors and each one opens up and you can see there the answer is really short <laughs> but I think it just helps to separate things up for, for the two different groups and, and makes that accordion style brings all the questions up I think that's actually a really nice usability function that you can you can use in the FAQ area um, Oh, and then this one here, and, and uh, Whitakers, who, who doesn't love Whitakers? And in fact, they were voted New Zealand's uh, most trusted brand. And their FAQs, who would think you'd need to ask questions about chocolate? But there they are, you never know. And here they are, they've got some really um, lovely FAQs, and it's just a simple format, it's just a simple content page. So again, you don't have to be flash with it. But it just keeps going down and links and links and links off to different articles and information that you can have on there. So a really lovely example of an FAQ, even on a product that you think you, there wouldn't be many. <laughs> um, and I'd imagine if you were an engineering firm, your FAQs will be quite detailed and specific and you might be linking off. So again, you make it specific to your business. I think just on that, generally your FAQ could actually just be pulling information you've already got on your site elsewhere, but what it's doing is just having it in one spot. Um, so quite often, like you touched on the refunds return policy, people have a full policy on the site, but sometimes just having a quick question and answer under an FAQ around it just helps, yeah. you know, so people aren't searching. It's that whole searching um, that you want to reduce on your website for information, right? That's right. And, and as a website user, I know websites should have FAQ sections. So I'm not going to waste my time searching all different blogs often, right? I'm going to just actually want to go to an FAQ section. So yeah, and like you're saying, you can link through to blogs or information like that Whitaker's example. Yeah, definitely. Thanks, Rhonda. Well, before we wrap up for today's webinar, we are open for questions now. So if anyone has questions about anything we've covered or even perhaps a few things we haven't covered and you're just wondering how it would fit in, um, feel free to use the chat or the Q&A button uh, to send those questions through. Um, in usual fashion, I always have a few questions uh, just around what we've covered off today. Um, so one I sort of had, um, I think it comes down to the team page because I know I'm someone who doesn't like photos <laughs> um, and I hate having my photo taken. So, um, you know, I think that's been a struggle and something I've realized a lot with clients. Um, what sort of, what can someone do if they're sort of struggling to get their team members to provide photos or, or get be around for photos even so that you can put them on the team page? Yeah, so um, I guess that's when they're wanting formal photos. Um, yeah, I mean, bribery is good. <laughs> I, I've seen some on, on that have been caricatures, so mm -hmm. art, artworks done. Yep. They can be even um, uh, symbols, you know, like for the different roles and mm -hmm. they're put in. But really, it's just about being creative with it. And I think making it, the style suit your brand. And I think your, your staff are probably more likely to be compliant if you're not making them dress up, or, you know, that sort of thing, or go into a, an environment that they're not familiar with. So if I was an electrician and I was wanting to get staff photos, I'd just turn up on site, take, take some photos of my guys on, on the job, you know? Um, and I think that really makes it relatable rather than getting them to dress up and have sit with and have a formal photo, yeah. Yeah, no, definitely. And even just a team photo sometimes takes that away because people don't often mind being in a photo if lots of other people are there. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. 
Um, we've had a question through from Vince as well. Um, vlog very, is a very 1990s word. Yes, I think it is. Um, what can you use instead of blog? Um, do you want to go first on that, Rhonda? Well, if you, if you look at Time Out's website, we don't use the word blog. We use the word stories. But it, it essentially is the elements of a blog. Mm. So, yeah, no matter what word you're using, you don't need to use it. You could just put news mm. or you could put, um, it, and it depends on your business. If your blog, blog is more around that tips and tricks, call it tips and tricks. You know, you don't need to use the word blog at all. Um, but essentially it is putting regular information out there even if it's once every couple of months and it's information where you're giving a professional opinion or or helping people with solve their problems that they, they're coming to your site for so yes very 1990s but the function is really what we're after and you can be creative and and have a look at what other people are doing what other people are calling it I loved if that mainland cheese site and the fact that they're they're they've even named their about us page not about us you know it's had what was the word they used our was craft pretty, uh, our craft yeah. yeah so you know you could actually create a different word for it but essentially the concept of a blog is still very important to building trust and credibility and I love your comment there that yes agree to photos and get pizza for lunch I think that's a good bribery is you know what it, is it? lunch is always a good bribe yeah yeah, no, definitely. Um, yeah, so yeah, definitely with the blog, just agree, it, it comes down to your brand, right? So what, what words are you using to describe your brand and how would you label that section or what are you using that section for? Um, so one thing could be, you know, like, past projects could end up being what your blog's called because it's actually a highlight or similar to the portfolio you showed us at the end. Some people's blogs are just a portfolio of their work. Mm -hmm. um, but like you said, it's that you know the key component of what you're actually using is a blog format or a blog layout um yeah and yeah. you don't you don't necessarily have to do that old school blog where you name everything with a month and a year and a topic and then you search or tag everything you can remove all that so like for time out we removed all that and we just put them up with with the month that they're coming out but that's about it we don't add any of those other blog elements or search elements Definitely. And just another question coming through. So how frequently should I be updating the areas of these web of these areas on the website? Um, are there any er particular areas I should keep my eye on more than others? Homepage, I think you should be doing a, a, a you know, that whole redesign of that homepage once every couple of years. Um, the, the about us, you need to keep it current to your team. Um, and also just if your story is changing, then reflect that in the about us page as well. Mm. Um, so really it just, if you are changing, then, then just keep that current. But if you're not, then you could just leave it. You know, I think how about us page um, will probably on the time up on the website, maybe just update it yearly just to make sure and just give it a review to make sure it's still current yeah All right. and similar the zeal page we we updated our about us page with the change we we took through covid so it's really taking those i guess key moments in your business and just going how does this apply i yeah. think a common analogy we use is that a website and a website project, there's never a destination. You're not heading towards something. You're, it's actually an ongoing journey. And so yeah. your website should be growing and scaling with your business. Yes. It shouldn't be a static website. Um, yeah. So I think that's very key. But on the other hand, just to add in a word of warning, you don't want to be jumping in and updating your UVP on your homepage every week. Okay, so you do want to be careful around that because what's happening is Google is crawling your website and picking keywords that people are searching for and relating it to your website. So there are areas you do want to think carefully about why you're changing um, before you actually go ahead and change them. Um, you know, if you're brand does a complete change and, and you sell a different product now, very good reason to do it. Um, but if it's just that you wake up and you go, oh, I'd rather something else, probably not the best idea. Just get some um, research around that first. Yeah. Uh, cool. So one last question from Vince. Um, so he's just asking, what do we think of various online review management software services? 
Yeah, I, I think they, they can be costly. I'd, I'd be careful jumping into them. There's nothing wrong with just actually doing it manually and doing it yourself. Um, so I'd only do it if you're getting really good big volumes that you're needing multiple people to help you handle mm -hmm. replying and management. If it's just a, you know, a, a general, you know, where you, one where you're managing low volumes, I wouldn't bother with them. Um, we we don't use one. We just have someone whose job it is to review that, that any any of that regularly. Um, so really, you can end up having a lot of these fancy management tools that have all got monthly subscriptions and they all add up. So I'd be I just. Yeah, not jump into it if, if you don't need it really. Yeah, I definitely evaluate your business and see what's fitting. Um, if it's in regards to just even asking for reviews, you know, sometimes it's as simple as when you send out, like I got a package yesterday and in the package there's a please, you know, if you love our product, please jump on here and leave a review. So there's some simple ways to add it in to just your everyday process that people will go through on your website um, that can, you know, result in no cost um, initially. But certainly if you're getting to a level where you really, really feel that you need something to help with that, um, then going to, to look at solutions with online review management um, software and other areas will can help. Great, so that's all the questions for today. Um, so I'm just going to go over our quick overview of today's uh, webinar. Um, so what we know um, is with more customers moving to the online space for their shopping and service needs, there is a strong need to ensure that your website provides the right message and helps gain the customer's trust. Um, so that's been our key focus of today is around trust and credibility and what what pages are important. Um, a HubSpot survey found that um, actually the pages we've mostly covered today are the ones that people visit the most. And at first I thought that was a bit weird, but then I think, oh, a lot of websites I do go to, I actually go to the About Us or Contact Us. And a lot of the time it's to find out if they're in New Zealand business or not. Um, so I think, you know, it just actually highlights what your own journey is and that it is, these are the most visited pages. Um, so the opportunity right now, creating these key pages and areas for your customers to get to know your business and brand online will assist strongly in the customer buying process and help to establish your brand as a trusted provider in your industry. So again, that I've said it a few times, people buy from people. And I think people will always buy from people. They want to see a face. They want to know someone's behind that. They want to know who they're purchasing from or who they're helping uh, with their purchase. Um, so that's sort of really where that strong um, sort of getting to know you as a business or as a brand will, will really help you in this space. Uh, a recommendation, so start by checking that your website has, because we've covered a lot of pages today, a well-designed homepage with key contact and clear call to actions on it, an About Us page that outlines your business's journey and helps establish trust and credibility, and then a contact page with your correct details, phone, email, address, store, contact hours, those I believe are your first steps. If you're just thinking we covered a lot today, those are the first ones probably to check. Um, one thing with the contact page that I do love, to, well, would like to add, um, don't add a contact um, method that you don't answer or respond to. So a lot of people, yes, have a link to your Facebook page if you have Facebook and you do post on it, but if it's not an avenue where you actually actively sit there and answer messages through Facebook, then don't tell people to contact you through Facebook. Okay, so it might seem really simple common sense there, but sometimes people go, I want people to contact me everywhere. If you're not going to be able to do it, then don't put it in. Similar to don't put a phone number of someone who's out actually on the field potentially and always busy and can't take calls. Put an email address, okay? Um, and then if you still want people to be able to call, maybe it's somewhere else just if they have any real concerns or anything they need to discuss um, over the phone. Um, so just a little bit about Zealed as well. So we have helped over 15,000 Kiwi businesses achieve digital transformation. That number should probably go up a little bit now over the last year. I think we've not updated that. Uh, but Zealed is currently supporting businesses in New Zealand, big or small, with our GEM initiative. So what this is, is it's a free website set up, regardless of whether you're e-commerce or a service base or a charity as well. Um, so we have different templates. Um, and it has a no success, no fee hosting for 
the first 12 months, um, which really is just to help businesses be able to get online and have the first 12 months without having to worry about additional hosting costs. Um, and so just a comment from one of our own uh, Get E-Commerce Movement uh, members, so Robin's Cottage, which probably has been one of the first ones to jump on board. Um, she's been through the gym process and the website setup, and we've been really great. Thanks, Robin. <laughs> but again, it has helped really grow her business. And I know that actually it's become ma her main part of business now. So it's just showing the importance of getting online. Um, and then next week's webinar, which is carrying on from the theme of this week's, I believe, um, and it's getting into creating an amazing, amazing user experience for customers with the right UX, so user experience and user interface design UI. So this it's, week we covered... Not, sorry, it's, it's yeah. in a fortnight's time. Oh, sorry, fortnight. Yes, yeah. thank you. Um, so, so today we talked about how to optimize your site for a user experience to build that trust and credibility. So get the information on there and get it the correct information on there in a fortnight's time it's covering the actual user experience in terms of how the look and feel as they go through and creating those pathways um, so that's going to be with logan one of our technical project specialists um, and i'm actually looking really forward to that one um, if at any time you would like to revisit any of our previous webinars or view this one um, if you if you don't uh, if you missed the email or you just want to find an easy place to see them all uh, feel free to head to zeal.com webinar series um, and that will have a list of all our webinars on there and videos for you to click into. Um, so I'd just like to say a big thank you to Rhonda for coming on today and taking us through um, this presentation with me. Um, it's been great, really enjoyed our discussion and bits we highlighted. Um, oh, gone a bit fuzzy there, out of focus, I'm back now. And a big thank you to everyone who has joined us today. I really hope that you've been able to take something out of it um, and that you're able to go and have a look at your website and see if there's any smaller areas you can improve um, for the long run, really. Um, so everyone have enjoy the rest of your day and we'll see you in a fortnight's time. Thanks, everybody. See, see you. Ya.